Um, in this video, we're going to be going over um, defining functions and using functions in C++. Okay, so in this course, we don't necessarily assume that you've written code before in C or C++, but we have assumed that you took a, a programming course and that you you know about writing functions in a programming language. So I'll talk a little bit. I mean, you know, we'll look specifically at the syntax of doing these in C and C++, but um, I'll talk in general also a little bit in this course uh, about more kind of, you know, higher level things. So the purpose of writing functions, that kind of thing, okay? So before I begin, though, um, this is our first example where I'm going to be using our lecture lecture examples, uh, code examples. So most of these lectures, I basically walk through code that's been written. Okay, so I encourage you though to actually download these and uh, do these yourself. Um, so get the code, compile it, maybe make changes and run along while you're watching uh, the videos. So for um, this course, um, there's a repository call on, on GitHub called the COSC236. Uh, the lecture examples, okay? So as usual, well, um, as you'll kind of learn on our assignments, um, you can clone this repository, but you're not a member of, of this repository. You don't have access to it, so you, sh you can't clone it using SSH this time because I'm not going to allow you to push changes to this one, but you can clone it HTTPS, which is kind of like cloning it read-only. But, I mean, it's not really read-only because you'll have a local copy of the repository, so you can make changes and check it into your local copy of the repository and even push it to your own repository. You just can't push it to this repository, if that makes sense. So anyway, um, the kind of the usual thing, this is kind of good practice here, so I'll, I'll just copy that again, copy the uh, URL, um, and we can use our code server to clone the repository, as usual. So we paste the URL um, in there. Notice it's, it's cloning the HTTPS URL this time, hit return. Uh, as usual, you, sh you should use the sync assignment directory, um, and this will clone it into a directory called um, lecture examples, right? Okay, so we're ready to go now. I've opened that up, um, and we should see the files here in a second. So, oh, I had this kind of open before, but um, anyway. Um, so yeah, a little bit about this repository. Um, uh, you do have to do the regular configure, um, and then it has a make target. It doesn't have really tests. So, so I mean, every one of the examples for each unit uh, compiles into its own separate executable, okay? So um, we can, um, um, I mean, you should configure it first, uh, make certain that everything configured correctly. Um, and then you can then you should do a make all. Um, so you know if you do your usual control shift one to do a clean, control shift two to do a make all, and then there is no test. So, you, so control shift three won't really do anything um, on this repository. But this will build all of the uh, examples. Um, it'll put all of the executables into um, the bin directory. Okay, so, and um, I've, I've named these. Um, like u01 dash something, u02 dash something for unit one, unit two, okay. The, these unit numbers might be a little bit different depending on when you're taking this course. So like in summer, I usually only have 10 units where I sometimes combine some of the units and, and I might have more than 14 or 15 some some semest semesters. But so anyway, so you might have to find the unit. Then. So this video, we're, we're on our first unit of the course usually. Uh, looking at, uh, it's supposed to be a bit of a review of programming, but and then specifically looking at um, doing some of these things in C. So today we're looking at doing these functions in C, okay? So what, once you've compiled this, um, I mean, you know, then if you make a change, for example, like that, and I'll save it, um, then if you just do Control shift 2 or, or make all, um, you know, the way make works is it only re recompiles what's, what's need what needs to be recompiled. So since it only made a change in one file, it only recompiles that um, and relinks the uh, u01-1 executable. So if you want to run these, um, yeah, I mean, you do have to run these from a terminal um, um, uh, by hand. So you'll have, you have to open up a terminal um, in the normal way uh, on your dev box. Uh, and then the way to run these is, like I said, they're in the bin directory, all of these executables. So if I want to run the execute the 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 example lecture example that I just compiled. You do dot slash, um, um, and then you give the name of the directory that's in bin, and then you give the name of the 
the program, U01-1. So that will actually um, execute it, will run it, okay? So that's just quickly how to use the lecture examples, all right? Okay, so let's get to the main purpose of this, um, our, our um, lecture today. So we're going to look at um, functions in C++, so looking at um, uh, using predefined predefined functions that are in uh, the, the, the libraries that are given to you uh, in the C language, and then defining our own. Um, and then we'll also look at uh, how you pass in parameters, value parameters versus reference parameters, which is maybe the most important um, um, aspect of this. Well, maybe not. And then also about a little bit about scope um, in C++ programmers, uh, programs. Okay, so. Um, all right. So. Um, oh, another thing I, I quickly forgot to set up. Um, uh, I like to run these in debug mode, so for your assignments, it's set up so that the debugger will run the, the, the debug executable. So that, that's the, um, when, when you do a launch of the debugger, it'll ex be expecting an executable to be created called debug, and it will run that executable in uh, the, the GNU debugger. Um, for the lecture examples, um, I mean, you know, you, you might not really want to run it in the debugger. I mean, maybe you do, but... Um, you can always just um, compile it and then run the code by hand in the terminal. Uh, but I do need to, or, or I prefer to, to use the debugger for these um, um, uh, for these lecture videos. So just so this is a little bit of Visual Studio Code configuration. So in this case, uh, how your debugger is done is set in this launch.json file in the VS Code. Um, so this kind of specifies all things, but in particular, I, I already changed this. So for our normal um, assignments for this class, you'll find that the program that the debugger is going to run is in the current workspace folder, which is the current folder that you have open, um, and then uh, it'll run the program called debug, right? But, but yeah, if you wanted to run a different program um, in the debugger, you would have to um, open this and edit this and give the name and the path to the program that you want to debug. Okay. But anyway, I guess I've already done that. So, um, Okay, so uh, another thing I'm going to show you, um, I like, I really like to, um, instead of like scrolling through or searching through to find stuff uh, in my files, I really like when my editor's IDEs have some sort of a, an outline view, right? So so normally if you have something like this, um, and a lot of IDEs have this nowadays, and you know, it's kind of like a, an outline or a table of contents in your, um, in, in a text document, right? So basically every function or everything like a function declaration or a declaration of a global constant shows up here. Um, so yeah, instead of kind of scrolling through or searching through stuff, you can kind of, if you have your outline up for your file, you can um, go directly to the things, okay? So we're going to start in the main function here, um, and I'm going to go ahead and, and run my debugger. So, um, launch it here. Um, all right, so the first thing I want to talk about are... Um, predefined libraries, okay? So to use a predefined library um, that somebody else has created, like like the standard ones that have been created as part of the C and C++ language, uh, so so when you're using an external library, the, the first thing you need to do is you need to include a header file, okay? That, that's what these pound includes do. It usually, it, you should usually put these at the very top of the file, right? So, um, um, we're going to show an example of using some predefined functions from the CMath library, all right? Um, it's always good to be able to have a reference of, um, of, of libraries that you use in a language. So, th this is an okay one. The C++.com has reference for all of the standard C library um, and C++ library um, um, li uh, library. Um, um, collections, basically, okay, so including CMath, right, so CMath has functions for, you know, trigonometric functions, sines and cosines, and um, exponential, so the, the log and, and, and the exponential, um, the, the square root, and, and raising things to a power, so, so the C language, C++ language, doesn't have a built-in operator for raising a value to a power. So um, you have to use a library function if you want to do something like that. So, 
Uh, we're going to look at uh, absolute. Where is that? It's at the very bottom here, right? So if you click on that, you'll see what you get in this documentation um, is what we call the, the function signature. Um, also, you, it's, it's, you can think of this uh, It's also sometimes called the function prototype, right? So the signature gives you everything you need to know in order to use a function. So for a predefined function, you don't need to implement it or no, even know how it's implemented. It's really just a black box, right? So, but you need to know how to use it. So the, the three pieces of information you need to use any function is you need the name of the function, exactly how it's spelled. So ABS for absolute value here. You need the list of parameters that the function takes as input. So, so all functions that we write in programming languages that are functional programming languages, uh, the function will usually have the ability to take input, right? And, and usually it has the ability to take, you know, as many input inputs as you need. So, I mean, it might not take any input. So, um, the, the next function we'll look at um, uh, doesn't take any input. But, but um, the, the absolute value function only takes one parameter's input, right? Uh, but you, you could have two parameters or three parameters or many parameters, okay? So, um, if you have multiple parameters as input, you separate them by comma. That's called a, uh, a, a parameter list or input parameter list, okay? And, and C and C++ are typed languages, so for each parameter you have to have the name of it, although you don't really care about the name because you can pass in any value or even a constant expression um, for a parameter, right? Uh, the, the name kind of gives you, sometimes gives you a hint on what that parameter is for, although usually for good documentation, uh, that there'll be, you know, the documentation, more specifically a description of what each parameter is, all right? So that should normally be part of the documentation for a function that you have here. So since this is a type language, we have to specify, uh, the, we have to know the, the type of each parameter, so a double here. And then uh, the third piece of information about each function that if you want to use it is the, what it returns. Okay, so usually a function will return a result or return a value. So in this case, uh, this function returns a double value. Okay. And you might be wondering, so there's actually multiple versions of absolute. Okay, this is an example of what's known as function overloading, which we will talk later about and use um, for various um, uh, purposes in this class. Um, so there are other versions. Uh, basically, th there's other versions. That they, they work pretty much the exactly the same way, but if, if you pass in like a, a single precision float instead of a double precision floating value, um, there's a version that will work with a single pre precision floats. Uh, and long double is actually like a, instead of uh, using eight bytes, it uses uh, is that right? It uses six, uh, uh, um, sixteen bytes. That's not right. Um, um, so I can't remember exactly, but uh, but yeah. So this this is even a bigger, you know, real value number, floating point number, a, a long double, right? Um, and then later on, we're going to talk about templates, I and mean, that's kind of what this last um, result, this last function definition here. Okay, anyway, so let, let's, let's go on. So if we want to use the absolute value function, um, I'm still in my debugger here, right? Oh, um, oh yeah, sorry, I scrolled to the top there. So let me go back here to main. Um, so that now, since we included the absolute function, then, then we can just use it um, like any other function or, or like any function that, that you write yourself, um, like we're going to do here. Um, in our next step here, right? So in particular, like if we want to take the absolute value of, of a variable that we have, we can do that. So let me step to that. So here we've got a variable called neg value. So notice it's not called x or anything. It doesn't matter what, what we call. If we want to pass in a local variable, that's fine. We can call it whatever we want as long as it's, as it's a double, you know, or if it's a float, it would use the, the version that takes a float as input and so on, right? But yeah, if we call this, and, and then notice it's, it absolute returns the result. So in this case, I'm directly using the return result to pass it into my output stream. So that's what these you know, double left arrows to the C out mean, right? So the result that's returned from absolute should be passed into my output stream and should end up in my output um, that we'll see on our terminal here when I step over this line um, um, from this output statement, right? So, I mean, it does what you would expect the absolute value function to do. So, you know, the value was negative, so it finds the absolute value of it, and, and the result is a positive 3.14159 error, okay? Um, all 
So notice, I mean, we passed in the values from the function um, directly. Um, so there's different ways we could use the output value of that function. So, um, um, so for example, we could save the result in another value. So that's what this example shows here. So instead of passing this directly to, to be used in some way, we, we, we take the result and save it into another local variable called abs value. But, but the result is the same. But now we've got it saved in a local variable that we can reuse for some purpose, right? Um, or you can even directly use these in um, like a mathematical calculation. So we could take the absolute value of, of, of a number and then mul and then the result of that will be multiplied by here. We're using another function from the, uh, the, the CMath library, the pow function that I, that I mentioned, which raises um, a um, value to a power. So here's the, um, the um, function signatures for power right um, and, and the documentation for the the parameters okay so again it's mostly just different versions for either a double or or a regular float or a long double right but, but anyway it takes a base number like like if i want to square um if i want to take three squared the the base would be three and the exponent would be two in that case right so here we're, we're kind of calculating the um, um the area of a circle so we're taking the, 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 this really holds kind of an approximation of pi, 3.14159, um, although we had it negative before. So now we, so now we have positive 3.14159 times a radius 3 that we're squaring, right? Um, so, um, yeah, I did that. So I kind of redid the calculation there, but um, if we didn't, if we didn't do this, it would work either way, so, so both ways, and so this would get the correct result. So what I'm saying is that this is equivalent to it as if I had written it out by hand, like the 3.14159 times radius times radius, okay? Uh, and that should give us the result of what the area of a circle with a radius of 9 um, um, is there, um, so 28.2743, okay? Um, by the way, uh, the Libraries um, in many programming languages have uh, functions, uh, but they have other things. So for an object-oriented language, uh, it might have actually classes that you can use, uh, but they also might have constants, although I have come to realize that uh, this documentation um, doesn't list all the constants. But uh, for just for example, um, pi is defined um, with the name um, m underscore pi in uh, the, the CMath library, right? So, so it's, it's, you really shouldn't use, I mean, this is bad for me to do this. So, so this is only giving me like five digits of precision here, right? You wanna use, in order to get the most accurate calculation possible, you wanna use as many digits as possible and you don't wanna type all those digits out by hand by looking it up, Googling or something. So you wanna use the constants that are defined like, like pi and, and Euler's number and, and whatever. Uh, will, will usually be defined somewhere for you um, in the libraries for the language, usually like a math library, right? So, so since I've already included CMath, um, I can uh, use the more appropriately, more correctly, using the mpy constant. So if I save that um, and recompile, uh, it should compile just fine, and we will get the same result um, here. Um, we step through all that again, right? So again, and you might be wondering. I mean, you know, we are actually using as many digits of precision as we can because that's the, what the mpy uh, constant gives you. Uh, we we still only see four things output, but that's because by default the C out stream just out outputs a limited number of of digits. So you can actually tell it how many um, digits to output by setting the precision um, on the output streams, but um, I'll leave that um, for some other time. So, um, Okay, so um, the next thing we're going to look at is uh, defining our own functions. Okay, so real quickly, um, we can define our own functions um, and um, in particular, let, let's say you want to have a, a version of the absolute value function that takes an integer, okay? 
Um, to tell you the truth, you could actually just reuse the, the, the ones in, in CMath because it will kind of convert um, a, an integer into a floating point value silently for you, but it will return a double, which could be a problem. Um, so, so we want a, a version of absolute value that will take an integer and return an integer as a result. So we're going to be overloading the, the ABS, the, the name ABS function ourself, um, with a new signature here. All right. Um, so in this example code, we've already got that. Uh, here it is up near the top, right? So again, this takes kind of the, the same parameters, but, but the, the types of the parameters are different. So it takes uh, some integer number as input, um, and it returns an integer result, okay? So this is, this is how you define your own function. You, you provide, th this is kind of what we call the signature of the function, the name of the function, the, the list of parameters, with the types and then the return value, the return type of the function, right? Um, and then if you're de defined, if you're implementing your own function, then you have to give it a body. So right after the function signature, you'll have an open and cl closing curly braces, and then you'll have the implementation. So the body, whenever you invoke the function, it's gonna, the, the, the compiler will run this code in between the, the curly braces, which is the body of the function for you, okay? So usually, you know, you, you'll be using the standard kinds of things, if statements, um, case statements, loops, for loops, while loops, whatever, in order to implement the logic for the black box, you know. So a good function is, is a function that does one thing, perform, takes some input, performs the calculations of those inputs, and gives a result, right? And, and the person who's going to be using your function doesn't necessarily have to know or really even care how you implement it. You, you just need to know, you know, what it takes as input and what do you expect it to do and give you it as its result, you know. So that's the difference between just using a function, but uh, of course if you need to implement your own function, then of course you have to worry about, you know, how are you going to implement uh, that piece of, of logic, that piece of functionality, okay. So the absolute value, mathematical absolute value is relatively simple. We just need, um, you know, if the number is negative, we want to, um, sorry, I uh, had, uh, uh, modify that before, so um, that was a, that's a bug now, but, but yeah, if I fix that, um, if the absolute value, or if the number that you pass in as input is negative, less than zero, we want to negate it, uh, take the negative of that, so that'll make it positive, and that'll give us the absolute value. Otherwise, just return the number, okay? So for functions that return a value, um, you have to have at least one return statement in there, and as soon as you hit the return statement, no more code is going to be executed in this function, okay? So if we come in here with a negative number, uh, sorry, the, a negative number, the number is going to be less than zero, so it'll go into the if part of our if statement, and since it hits the return statement, it will return immediately back to where we called the function from. Um, it's going to return uh, the result of this expression, so taking the negative of the number that you input, right? So, yeah, I mean, again, going back to main, here where we call that function. Um, so, so the result, so if I call my own, you know, our own user-defined version of absolute, um, it, it, it's like jumping into and executing the, that code in the body of the function, and as soon as it's the return statement, it returns that result. So in this case, since we passed a negative 2 as a number, it's going to take the negative of that, so become positive 2, and then positive 2 is going to be returned, and that, that positive 2 we assign into um, the local variable that we're calling posit here, right? So the result should be that um, the, um, oh, I need to recompile because because uh, I had that bug in there. So notice it still said negative 2. Let's, let's recompile. Let's, let's stop. Uh, let me set a breakpoint here so I can just run the... Um, a breakpoint right there. Well, that's not... Uh, no. So for the debugger, uh, all your breakpoints should show up down here. Um, I'm, it looks like I'm having a little bit of a problem. That, so you should normally be able to see the point of... Um, anyway, so let's, let's stop, recompile. Oh, there it is. So I guess when you're in the debugger, um, those don't display. Okay. So anyway, I've only got one breakpoint now. It's right at that that spot there. Recompile that so we can fix that bug that I just had there. Um, and let's restart. 
and then if we continue on, we should break at that point where we were at. Okay, so now if I step over, there, now it's working. So, so now we get a value positive 2 because it gets the absolute value, all right? Um, okay, another example, but use a slightly more complex user-defined function, although this is still a function that's returning a value, okay? So, uh, but um, we're going to use uh, another predefined function, the random function from the standard library. Okay, so the purpose of this function, let's, let's go ahead and jump to it, um, is um, um, we want it to randomly roll some number of dice, okay, and, and um, so we're going to pass in two parameters. The first parameter is the, the number of sides on the dice, okay, so this function would actually work if we want to build like a Dungeons and Dragons game, so if we need to roll some d4s, we could say we're rolling four-sided dice, so, so pass in four, or if we're rolling d20s, we could pass in 20 for the first parameter, right? And then the second one is the number of those dice to roll. So in this case, we're going to kind of play a game of craps where, where you roll a two standard six-sided dice, right? And then the function is supposed to roll two random dice. So you, so you get a random number from one to six when you roll one dice. So it rolls two of those, and it should sum those up and return the sum. So, so that's what this function is supposed to do, all right? So... Um, if you look in this example code, though, so I want to talk a little bit about the difference between the function signature and the function implementation. So um, at the top of the code, I'm going to stop the debugger again because I want to do a recompile here in a second. So at the top of the code, you'll see that there, there's two places where we've got the, the roll excited dice in times function um, kind of declared. So there's one up here at the top, right, but it doesn't have a body. So notice it, it has the function signature, so it has the two input parameters, the name of the function, and the return type, but it just has a semicolon, right? And then there's another place after main where we have the function where it has the same signature, but instead of a semicolon, it has the, the open and colon, open and closing curly braces that, with a body and implementation, right? So in C, you can, you can separate the declaration of a function, which is what this function prototype is at the top, from the, uh, the the implementation of the function, all right? Um, and um, this is the way that we write libraries ourselves, our own user-defined libraries. So if I want to write a library of functions that can be used in other files, what I would do is I would write the function prototypes and I would put those in a header file, so a .h file or a .hpp file, right? And that is the, the thing that you include um, in some other piece of code if I want to use this roll excited dice in times, right? So, so you only put the function prototypes, you know, which, which is the declaration of how you use the function, how you call it, in the header file. Um, and then you put the actual implementations in a separate file so that you can compile these separately and then link them together um, with, with the code that wants to use your implementation. So, so the implementations usually go in a .c or a .cpp file, right? Um, the kind of one reason I'm illustrating this here is that um, um, when we use uh, the roll excited dice um, in our main function, um, the actual implementation is after main. So um, if I didn't, if I don't have a declaration, if I don't have either the implementation or the declaration of the function before I actually first use it, so if I comment that out. Um, it's actually um, going to be a compilation bug, right? Because uh, when I first try to use the function in main, um, uh, there's no declaration of how to use the function before I first try to use it, right? So, so if we can try it and compile this now, uh, and in fact, um, well, um, so if we compile it, uh, we'll see that we get a... Um, Compilation error here on line 152. Um, uh, I should be detecting the problem there. I'm not certain why, but um, um, it should be showing up in my um, um, output here. So, but anyway, yeah. So, so I mean, the problem is basically there here. I need, I need to check my IntelliSense here. Got it installed, right? Yeah. Hmm. Um, Um, so anyway, oh, there it is. So yeah, sometimes it takes a little while for the IntelliSense to update. Um, I'm not certain how to force it to do that. So, um, 
so, oops, uh, no, that's not the problem, though. Um, I had accidentally pasted something there, sorry. Uh, so anyway, yeah, so, so this is a um, compilation problem um, because um, uh, this function hasn't been declared, all right? So, you know, uh, I mean, you can just, uh, if you're just writing your own, own functions and you're only using them in one file, you can just put the declaration before your first use of it, right? Um, so I could have just put the, 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 um, the or sorry, the, implement, the implementation before the first use of it. I could, so I could just move this implementation above where we use it in main, okay? Um, but that doesn't always work, and it doesn't work if I want to put the um, uh, implementation in another file, so... Um, so anyway, oh yeah, this this kind of goes away. So if I have it commented out, I won't show it in my in my outline. Anyway, so let's let's put that back and um, make certain that we can compile. All right. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and set our breakpoint there, and let's. Um, step in and look at what this function does, okay? So here we're about ready to call it, so let's go ahead and just take a quick look at it, right? So we'll step into it. Um, so again, this, this function takes uh, two parameters, so we passed in six as the number of sides, right? So, you know, if we go back and look at how we called it. So here's another thing, I don't, don't remember if I mentioned it, but, you know, you, you don't have to pass in a, a, a variable, like a local locally defined variable. You can just pass in constant expressions when you're passing in things by value. So I just pass in a constant six and a constant two when I call the function here. Um, so now, you know, when I'm in my function, um, if I actually step one more step here, you know, so six got passed in um, and is uh, assigned to the, the parameter named number of sides. So, so our, our dice have six sides that we're rolling here, um, and we're rolling two dice total. So the number of dice to roll total is two, right? So the implementation of this hopefully is not uh, too tough. Um, we just loop. Um, um, so the number of dice we have to roll, we, we loop that number of times. But the, the thing is, we're using another function here called rand. Okay, so rand is a function um, that's from the C standard library. Okay, so if we want to use rand, we have to include C standard library. Um, so again, here's the documentation. So the C standard library is kind of a bit of a catch-all library. It's got um, a, a bunch of things, like some uh, things for old-style um, character strings and the old malloc and free. We're not using malloc and free in this class. Um, we're using C++, so we use the newer way of doing dynamic memory management, which is the, the, the new and the delete, okay? But that's in, in an upcoming unit here. Um, um, but um, yeah, and anyway, so we've got the RAND function, right? So RAND, if, if you don't know kind of how this works, um, returns a number between zero and RAND max. And RAND max is kind of like the, the largest integer value that can be represent, represented in an integer. So notice this RAND, RAND is an example of a function that takes no parameters. So void in this case means it doesn't take any input, but it returns an integer as the result. And the, and the integer that returns will be a number from zero to you know, the, the largest possible integer that you can represent. So it's con it's a common trick then if all you have is ran to generate random integers. If I, if I actually need a number from 1 to 100, if you do a mod by 100, remember that that gives the remainder. So it takes the random number it returns and and the remainder then is going to be a random number between 0 and 99. So the remainder of divided by 100 is it can be from 0 to 99, right? And if I actually want a number from 1 to 100, I just add 1 to that. So, so the random number from 0 to 99 will end up being a random number in the range from 1 to 100. Okay. So that, that's what we're doing in um, our um, roll inside a dice here. So, so we call rand, and then by modding by the number of sides, so if we want to roll six-sided dice, we'll end up with a result between 0 and 5, but then we add 1 to that to get what we normally expect when we roll a dice, a, a random result from one to six, right? And then we sum that up and return it, right? 
So our first dice that we rolled there, that I just rolled, um, was a two. So we rolled a two at random. So I can see that by looking at my, my output, my local variables, um, after we ran that. Now I'm going to roll my second dice here. Our second dice roll was a five, right? So we're going to get two plus five. So my sum should end up being um, seven. And seven is what we're returning as a result here, okay? So when we return from here, we'll be back to where we called it from. So, so seven was returned as a result of calling this function because it rolled a two and a five and it summed those up. And so seven got assigned into my local variable called sum here. Um, all right, and then I'm going to move on. So there's kind of an example, like if you want to roll, if you want to play 10 rounds of like craps, you can use this function to, to do that. But I'm going to skip over that. So I'll set a break point there and continue past that. So. Um, all right, so now we're ready to talk about um, value parameters versus reference parameters. Okay, so this is an important concept. So everything that we've looked at so far uh, we've been passing in all of our parameters by value. That's the default way of, of passing in parameters. So if I can go back and look at the role of excited dice in times, um, when we pass these in, uh, basically when you pass by value, that means that you're, we're passing in a copy of, of the value. Okay, So we passed in 6 and 2 when I just called this function. So a, a copy of six was passed in and assigned to the parameter named number of size. A copy of two was passed in um, and, si and assigned to the uh, number of, of, of rolls here, right? So um, what that means, since that's a copy, so, so let's, let's, let's look at this uh, change the value parameter function. So, so here's another function called change the value parameter. I'm going to just step into it in the interest of time here. So, so we've got, we're passing in three parameters so this function takes uh, two integers and a double as input parameters. Um, and this is probably an example of a void function. So, so I don't um, actually use any, get any re return from it. So let, let's see how we declared the change value parameters function, right? So here we're going to call it where we're passing in 5, 7, and 9.9 .9 as our parameters. Uh, I'm going to step into that. Right. So this is an example of a void function I'm talking about. So functions don't have to have any parameters. So if they don't have any parameters, you just have nothing in the parameter list, right? Uh, that, that's how you define a function with no input. Uh, likewise, if you want to have a function that doesn't return a result, which is, you know, sometimes there's needs for that, uh, you use void um, as the, re the, the return type for the function. Okay. So in this case, this is a non-value returning function. Okay. But it does take parameters, um, but these parameters are passed in by value, just like we, we saw. So, um, you know, so basically a copy of the value 5 got passed in and assigned to parameter 1, and a copy of the value 7 got passed in to 2, uh, parameter 2, and a copy of the value 9.9 .9 got passed in to parameter 3, okay? So now if I assign new values to parameter 1, parameter 2, and parameter 3, so as you can see, so, so now parameter 1, 2, 3 have different values, okay? But this only overwrote wrote the copy of the values that were passed in here, okay? So when we return back to our function, uh, nothing happened to the original values because we only modified the copies since we passed by value here. We didn't modify the values in these parameters in the original caller, uh, param1, param2, param3, right? So, yeah, if we output those, we'll see that they still have the values 5, 7, and 9, 9, or we can see that in the debugger. So they still have the values 5, 7, and 9, 9 back here in our main scope, our main function scope, all right? Now, the other way you can pass in parameters is passing them by reference, okay? So when you pass in a, a, a parameter by reference, what you're really doing is you're passing in the memory address of the actual location where a value is stored, okay? So in this case, we're going to be passing in uh, these two parameters to this other function by reference, both of these by reference. So in this case, I'm showing another um, function here that takes two parameters, but it takes a character, a car parameter as the first parameter, and a Boolean parameter. So Boolean is a built-in type for C++. So Booleans just can only have two values, true or false, right? 
Um, so it takes a Boolean as the second parameter here. So let's step into that. So let's, let's look at how do you pass in a parameter by reference. So to pass in a, a parameter by reference, uh, notice we've got this ampersand here, okay? So ampersand is generally used in C and C++ to mean a reference, um, a, a memory reference, or some sort of a, a referenced address, okay? So by putting ampersand, the ampersand just has to be in between the two things. So it can be like with a space after the type. Um, it can have space before and after. Um, our class style guideline, I prefer to have the ampersand next to the, um, the, the, the type the declared type for the parameter, because I read that as this is a reference to a character and this is a reference to a Boolean, okay? So when we pass these in by reference, we're not passing in a copy, we're passing in the actual memory address, you know, a, a reference to the same memory location um, as those parameters in the calling scope, right? So inside of this function, um, when I'm referencing, you know, when I'm doing things to modify pram1 and pram2, I'm going to be modifying the same location in memory as the caller gave me. So, so the, the, the result is this is going to actually modify, this is going to actually change the value back in my caller, right? So, so I'm going to modify. So remember, I mean, originally my parameters had x and true as the values that I passed in by reference. So now I'm going to modify them um, to have y and false, and then when we return back from our caller, um, if we print them out, you'll see that they, they now are y and false. Or, or, or if we look in our debugger, um, our ref pram one has a value, the value of y, and the ref pram two. So, so they, they receive the result of modifying those parameters from calling the function. Okay. Um, all right. So so you know what what use are reference parameters? Well, that that's one use. Although this is not considered um, um, a very good reason to use reference parameters, but you know sometimes it's necessary. If I need, you can only return one result, one value from a function in C and C++. And sometimes I do need to return multiple results from a function. So I can't really do that easily in C++. Um, the, the kind of the preferred way is to, to actually create some sort of a, a structure or something and return the whole structure. But another way you can do that is you can just use reference parameters. So I could pass in parameters that are not meant to be inputs, but are meant to, that, 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 that the, the function that I'm calling is going to put results, multiple results, into those parameters to return back to me. Okay, so that, that's one use of reference parameters. Um, another, the, the main way that we use these in, in, in C++, the object-oriented version of C, um, is sometimes a parameter, you know, so for, for built-in types like integers or uh, doubles or floats, they only take like four bytes or, or, or eight bytes or two bytes, so they're not really that big. So it's not all that expensive to make a copy of each of those values, even if I have five, six, seven parameters, you know, so that's, that's not really a big deal. But if I'm passing in an object as a parameter, which we can do, um, or if I'm passing in an array as a parameter, which we'll talk about in the next next video, uh, that could be expensive. I mean, you know, like, like an object could have thousands or even millions of bytes of data encapsulated in the object. So if I, if I pass that in by value, I'd have to copy all of that information from somewhere to somewhere else before I call the function, right? And that can be really expensive. So, um, so, so that's a pretty common way that we're going to be using reference parameters a lot. So, so for, for performance reasons, we might want to just pass it in by reference um, so that we don't, don't have to make a copy. So even though we're using it as an input, um, uh, uh, we still pass it in by reference um, to save the, the overhead of having to copy all that. Okay. Um, all right, so one final quick thing. Um, it is actually possible to uh, not only pass in a value by reference as input to a function, but as this last example shows here, um, the, um, what was it called? Um, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping over something. So real quick, I, I do want to, I've, I've used the word scope, local versus global scope a couple of times here. This is another important concept, okay? Um, so anytime you declare a variable, um, like inside of curly braces, it's inside what's known as a local scope. So all these variables, and, and that also includes the parameters, even though they're in kind of the, 
the, the declaration of the function, but they are also within the scope of the function. Okay, so, so parameters and local variables that we declare, like neg value and, and all those things, these are all local to the main function here. And that's kind of what this list of locals and the debuggers is. That, that's all these variables that were declared inside of our main function. All right. Um, now, you can have things that are in the global scope. These are global variables, right? So, so I've actually got a couple things defined. So these aren't defined inside of any curly braces. These are just outside of anything at the top of my function here, right? So this, this can be used, used to define global variables um, and global constants, okay? In this class, never use global variables. That's, that's kind of a hard rule. So global variables are frowned on as bad practice. They, uh, for, for various reasons that, that maybe we'll talk about, um, they make your code into spaghetti code. They can be dangerous to you, so you should never find yourself using global variables, even though I've got one here. But it is perfectly fine to use global constants. Those are very useful con uh, concepts. So a, a, a constant in C++ is defined kind of in the same way, but you put the const keyword um, in front of declaring the variable. Another thing, this is just a convention, but by convention, we use all capital letters, so all capital letter, um, camel case no a, uh, notation, in case I have a multi-word um, declaration here. But all capitals is meant to indicate that this is a constant, a global constant, instead of uh, a regular variable, okay? Um, anyway, so the, these are examples, these all three things are defined in the global scope. So anything that's um, underneath Anything in the same file, so all the functions um, uh, that have their own scopes are inside of the global scope of this function. So all these functions can actually reference these global variables and these global constants here, including um, our main function um, um, down here. All right. So that's that's all I'm showing um, uh, here at this part of the main function. Um, uh, that, that's I kind of skipped ahead. That, that's all I'm showing down here. So you know we we can um, access the my global variable and get its value, um, and we can access those global constants pi and uh, um, e here um, and print those out. Okay, but you can have scopes within scopes. So anytime you have a loop or, or um, 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 an if statement, those curly braces are another local scope that's local to the function scope. Okay. So uh, here, I mean, this isn't even a loop or anything, but, but when I, if I have an open and closing curly brace, this scope is local to the main scope. So if I define like a variable called example of variable scope um, here, right? And, and if I set its value to five, oops, um, um, I hit continue, didn't I? I didn't mean to do that. So let me, let me set a break point here and restart that. Actually, let me clear off all these breakpoints. So a breakpoint um, here again, relaunch, and continue back down on this base. Okay, so if I set uh, a variable called example variable scope here, um, it has a value of five in my my main, the, the scope of my main function here, which is what the function I'm currently in here. So you can see it, or is it, um, Uh, um, oh, I shouldn't have stepped over there. Let me, let me restart that. So, so at this point, um, um, so it's a little bit tough to see in the um, the debugger because basically, as soon as I step over this line, it's going to assign it, but it's going to be inside of my local scope here. So um, let me let me. Um, I do kind of want to illustrate this point, so let me add in another line of code here. There we go. So uh, let's rebuild that. And let's launch again. And continue down that point. Okay. So now, hopefully, I'll be able to illustrate this. So um, here, we, we declare another variable called example of variable scope. Um, so we should see it get assigned a value of 5 here um, in the debugger. Uh, or is it, there it is. 
So it just got defined by five. So we're still in, in the scope of our main function, and so it should print out that the variable is five. But now we've entered in um, uh, another sub-local, an, another sub-scope, or I, I don't know exactly what to call it, but this scope is, is inside it. So any variables that we declare in here are local to the current set of curly braces, okay? And if you declare a variable with the same name as a variable in a, in a scope above the scope, it will uh, mask that variable. So now I've got another variable called example of variable scope, but it's inside of this scope. So it's masking the other variable. So, so now you can see that before we assign it, it has garbage, but if we step over, um, now it has a value for it too, but this didn't affect, so there's actually two variables now named these, one in my main scope and one in this inner scope here, right? So when we print this out, we see that it's 42 inside the scope, but it's still 5 outside here. So that, that variable went away in my inner scope, um, and um, um, we still have the variable called in the outer scope with that same name, all right? Um, and then, yeah, we do have the my global variable here, you know, so that had the value 42 as we shown at the top, and we have the, the global constants, which are good things to define if you need them, right? You should never use magic numbers, so I should never use like 3.14159 scatter all over the place. You, if, if you have a number that's like a constant value used in multiple places in your program, you should de declare a constant somewhere and then reuse that symbolic name of the constant. Um, all right, so that, that's about scopes. And then as a final thing, um, uh, as I started mentioning, um, you can um, actually return a reference from a function just like you can pass a reference into a function. Uh, we'll make use of this a little bit um, in some of our things of our class. Let me show you kind of how that works. So we've got a function called return reference example here. Um, so notice this function returns a reference to an integer and what we're returning is I've, I've got another array defined in the global scope. So the value at index 0, 1, 2, 3, the, the, the value at index 3 of this array is 30. Or, yeah, it's 30 here, right? So we're just returning, but we're not returning the, the value 30. We're returning a reference to that memory address that holds 30 here, right? Um, So, um, if I call the function, remember, it's returning a reference to that memory address, um, but, um, so I know this can be confusing, but when you assign, even though I'm returning a reference, when I do this assignment, it's still going to copy the value that was referenced on the right-hand side to the memory location referenced on the left-hand side here. So, so really, the, that, that value at array location 3, um, which is... Um, I think I can see it here, yeah, which is, uh, has a value of 30, gets copied in here. But, but we should see that, we, that, that 30 um, ends up in my integer, right? Uh, and when we print it out, so we see that, okay? But, you know, the, this my integer isn't pointing because we did, we're not assigning the reference. So, so just because we, we copied the value that was referenced, that was returned from here um, into my integer, uh, if we assign 50 here, we're not going to overwrite my array 3 here. Right. Um, so if I assign 50, my integer now has the value of 50 in there, but my array 3 still has the original value of 30. Okay. But this might look kind of funny, but I mean, a reference is really being returned here. And anytime you have a reference to a memory location, you can assign things into that. So I could actually uh, use that uh, returned reference um, on the left-hand side of an assignment state in, in C to actually assign the value into that reference memory location. So in this case, that, that is going to assign value 100 um, into the array, my array at location 3 here, because that's what's being returned um, from this function here, right? So, um, so now if we look at my array 3, it actually has 100 um, in there, right? All right, so that was the side, but like I said, we'll run into that um, again um, later on, so... Okay, um, that was a little bit longer than I wanted to go on this first video, uh, but we covered all these things, so talking about uh, defining our own functions and using predefined functions in the C libraries, value parameters versus reference parameters, um, and the, the concept of scope. Okay, these are all important things. Make certain you understand these well 
before you move on from this video and this unit. Um, all right, here's uh, here's those kind of references I used in here. Here's a tutorial that might be useful. Uh, but yeah, that's it for this video, and I will see you guys all in the next one.